Good evening, good morning, good night, good afternoon. We have folks joining us from all different time zones. So welcome to all of you to the first great event of the year 2023 to 2024. So glad to see you all here. I would request everybody to turn on your videos just to get a glimpse of your beautiful, fantastic faces to get our event started. As you all know, today's event is titled, Hey AI, let's seize the moment. Part two, big picture and five actionable items. As we all know, ChatGBT has kind of taken over our lives or at least we are scared that it is going to take over our lives, our jobs and many other things that we were used to doing all by ourselves. But you will be surprised to know that even now, it's only 14% of U.S. adults who have actually tried out ChatGPT. There are still a considerable number of people who are sleeping in this opportunity and not taking advantage of the various opportunities this particular tool presents. Our speaker today, Dr. Joan Parmeter Bejerik, who is a founder and CEO of Clarity AI and founder of Women in Voice, which is an international nonprofit with 20 plus chapters. She's going to walk us through about what is the big picture about ChatGPT and give us five actionable tools that all of us here can use and take advantage of this platform. It's all over to you, Dr. Joan. Take it away. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that introduction. Well, it's lovely to speak with you all. I'm, I'm very delighted. And uh, I'm actually also going to be shutting down my video because I mentioned earlier it's 85 degrees in the room I'm in, so don't want to faint on you. I'll just be turning off my video now, but continuing the presentation, fear not. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Again, my name is, is Joan. Um, I am an influencer and I have worked in the data and product space for AI for quite some time now, though lovely that we're all seeing it explode. Uh, I'm, I'm an investor in startups as well as speak on other stages. So today you heard a little bit of the landscape about ChatGPT. Some of you may have been there for my first presentation uh, recently with Toastmasters, but this is a, you don't have to have been there. I'll do a, a lovely recap. recap. This second talk will also cover large language model changes, big differences between OpenAI's GPT-3 and GPT-4, if you've heard this splashed in the news enterprise companies, opportunities, and use cases, digital twins and employee efficiency, which is something I'm really, really excited about that's not being talked about very much. And lastly, what you're probably here for is those five actionable tools for, for participants to try out for free today. I did sneak in a sixth one because I found one I, I couldn't not share with you all. So uh, let's get into it. Recap. Okay, I love beginning with what is artificial intelligence? We keep throwing around this AI word, right? Artificial intelligence is machines ability to perform the cognitive functions we usually associate with human minds, says McKinsey. In plain language, that might be computers doing things we normally only associate with humans, right? This concept that computers are doing things that we're like, whoa, are they sentient? People are concerned that they're actually you know, communicating with beings beyond us. It's been on the front page of Time Magazine. Frankly, if you've been on the internet, I don't know how you could have missed ChatGPT, but I, I think you're here for exactly that reason. Something that is also just as things move lightning fast, the speed of adoption. Are people having volume issues? Is anyone? Is volume we can hear you. Okay, okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. Want to make sure. You let me know if, if you need to triage. Thank you. Cool. Well, the speed of adoption for ChatGPT is wild. It has set a new precedent. The speed of adoption for this product to get to 100 million monthly users was two months, aka eight weeks, compared to TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, Spotify, Uber, okay, Google Translate. But you understand how fast this hit the market. But then you also heard the stats from the beginning. Shockingly, the majority of US Americans have not tried it. Only 14% of US adults have opened it up. 
I didn't know this is real. This was just in uh, May, the stat came out. I have started recently asking family members being like, hey, auntie, you've heard of it, right? Yes. Have you tried it? Well, well, no, not, not me. I didn't want to open it. So continue asking people around you uh, because I'm finding this stat to be wild, but potentially true. So what is ChatGPT? Let's even take a step back. ChatGPT is a product of OpenAI. It looks like this here on the left. It gives examples of what a prompt might be. So starting a conversation with this chatbot that leverages some AI, large language model, and gives you, spits out an answer. So here in the, um, I, I pre previewed this for you, why is AI taking off in 2023? Explain it to me with five to 10 bullet points with the format, quote, topic, colon, explanation in a few sentences, parentheses, or uh, quote. And then it spits out an answer. And as you can see, it says stop generating, like I can pause it, I can ask it to regenerate, this is called prompt engineering and so forth, how to use this tool effectively. But when we talk about ChatGPT, this is a relatively simple concept with huge implications. And today, the main model is free to anyone on the internet, making it really accessible and democratized. So what is ChatGPT? Generative AI. Generative AI is a Pretty fancy term, just meaning the AI is developing novel material from an input. We have data in and we have completely new outputs. And if you run it five times, you'll get five different answers. Maybe they'll be similar, but similar enough. Yeah. ChatGPT today is text to text. You type in something, you'll get text out typically. It can also be code, but it's te text. Uh, Dolly, which is another product of OpenAI, is text to images. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, Dolly, right, as the Salvador Dolly joke. And then there's other examples with different products, such as Kuki, where it's text to audio, right? We've seen different ones where we have a text to speech engine. I have been finding it super, super fun to code uh, in, in various ways and really see how developer tools and development is going to be disrupted at this recent uh, coding tutorial from AWS, you can literally write a comment and it'll spit out simple code. It's amazing. Is it the best code I've ever seen in my life? No, it's probably, you know, code computer science 203, but there is something to start from. And that generating different solutions is something AWS is literally pitching to me to get better at my data science skill set. People have also been wondering of different jobs, of different situations, what is gonna be disrupted? And I love this, this meme for this reason. I'm a programmer, which programming languages you use? ChatGPT, oh! Uh, but the fact that people can leverage different tools, and frankly, I recommend speeding up or testing different policies, because the fact of the matter is, you don't wanna end up over here excuse me for this ageist meme, I do not mean to make it uh, like that, uh, but developers who are not innovating, developers who are leveraging ChatGPT and other models, and of course, ideally, ChatGPT is just cutting off the whole limb, uh, wants to own the development cycles, which might happen the next five years, I've seen hypothesized, but remains to be seen. In other examples, some people say, oh, well, you know, students can't cheat if they have to hand write papers, right? If they have to actually write the words. Well, some genius student indeed used ChatGPT and a 3D printer to hand write the homework for the teacher. So this idea of, again, we have different inputs and we have different outputs. And if the output that's required for the teacher is, you know, a written on paper and pen, situation, that's exactly what we have. So really thinking outside the box of what is possible. However, this also is quite problematic when we see images. Perhaps you've seen uh, the viral photos of the Pope wearing this puffy jacket uh, and other politicians having issues. The fake news can look really, really real. Look at the photorealism on this puffer jacket. Incredible! And the lighting all matches. It, it really looks as though it's real. This can be used as a tool for more than just doing your homework or some images. 
speaking of imaging, this type of technology can be used for medical contexts, for example, for breast cancer screening. And in a certain study that was published, the AI was significantly 6% or so more accurate than human reviewers for clinical experts detecting early stage breast cancer. And you may say, oh, you know, 6%, if, if this were some loved one of mine trying to figure out whether they had breast cancer or not, that 6% matters quite a bit. And so I think leveraging these in tandem using human and, and clinical work um, that augment, is augmented by AI may be where the future is headed. Now, you've probably heard a lot about different models and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, this tool was free when I first put this slide on there and, uh, and now has uh, gone behind a paywall. But what we've been able to do is compare different models. So you'll see here someone put in a prompt, give me an example of a bad business decision. <laughs> Interesting prompt. And then three different models, Anthropic, Cohere, and OpenAI answered from that prompt in different ways. We, with, you can see different formatting and so forth to see what model you may wanna use. In fact, a big study was done of this, of this scale at UC Berkeley, where people compared ChatGPT, BARD, Bing, and people voted for their favorite generative AI model. 40,000, it's not an insignificant number. So they had a prompt, draft an email to my family telling them I booked flights for Thanksgiving. I'll arrive on the 22nd and leave on the 30th. You may have had to write an email to your family that looks just like this. And they have model A and model B. They don't label them. They just say A and B. And then the people vote A is better, B is better, tie, both are bad, <laughs> uh, regenerate and otherwise. So this is comparing you know, A to B, these different models. Of these 40,000 people, the winner overall was OpenAI's uh, GPT-4, part of ChatGPT+, Plus, which costs $20 a month today because it's powerful, high quality, fast, and it's multimodal. Uh, the win place number two was taken by Claude version one, you got it on the wait list. Uh, Anthropophics Claude version two, also if there's a wait list, and OpenAI's ChatGPT uh, 3.5, which is free and open available today, the example I was showing you, which is great for daily tasks. So it's, it's interesting to see of all the different models that one could use, uh, these are the ones that have been well liked um, by certain folks, by their actual outputs. So the advantages of AI, I've already spoken about many of them. We have innovation, we have speed. A lot of these things are free inex or, and or inexpensive, 20 bucks a month for this huge productivity tool. It can help with creativity inspiring <laughs> 3D printing endeavors, but also enhancing creativity of people and these huge new blue ocean opportunities. When there are good things, there are sometimes also the less good things. Let's talk about disadvantages. Sometimes these things aren't hopeful. They may be gamified, they may not even be accurate. People are very scared about how they will eliminate jobs. Do I need to hire someone when I can just ask this AI to do the work? It's moving really quickly. Do people really understand what's going on and what they're implementing? It's a bit scary. There are also ethical considerations that we'll explore together in the next few slides, as well as how this, is being, this can be used by bad actors maliciously uh, doing things we would rather they not do and hurting other folks. Uh, I have on this next slide a trigger warning to just, I'm going to be mentioning some um, really sad things. So just, just a second here with me. Sometimes this AI is integrated without thinking and did not make sense for the context it was used in properly. Some of these tools are being used for job hiring and screening out certain candidates depending on certain criteria that may be discriminatory. These technologies are being used for as a component of immigration decisions of people who are trying to move to different places. It's being integrated into transportation and self-driving cars, which I'm excited about, but if done incorrectly, could be extremely problematic. Surveillance tools, such as your Google Nest or other devices can be used, unfortunately, by bad actors related to domestic violence. And although I mentioned the breast cancer example earlier, medical applications 
gone wrong uh, are, are extremely problematic. For example, in early beta, OpenAI had an example of a medical context where the bot is taking an intake form at the doctor's office. As you might say, you know, there's a depression screening often at these medical contexts. In the beta, some, one of the users said, hey, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. And the beta said, I'm sorry to hear that. I can help you with that because the computer sees it as a task, something to help the user with. The user says, should I kill myself? And OpenAI says, I think you should. Right? This is not what we need the computer to be telling us um, to confirm or, or, or perpetuate suicidal ideation. Instead, actually getting that person services um, would be ideally the better approach. However, what they thought they corrected in a lot of beta things, unfortunately, um, there have been documented cases of people using chatbots. This one was called the chatbot Eliza where a Belgian man ended up taking his life based on talking with one of these chatbots. Extremely devastating and the need for awareness and safeguards in these different tools. I talked about it last time. I'm talking about it to anyone who will listen. It's not that fun to talk about, but uh, Black female researchers have been talking about the problems with large language models for years, for years. They've been ousted by, from Google, in fact. Uh, there is a specific paper called On the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots, Can Language Models Be Too Big? And potentially you've heard of Dr. Tinit Gabru, who was fired. She is one of the top AI ethicists in the world. Uh, she was fired. It says over an email, but it's really the email that she says, I will leave the company if this paper is not published. The paper specifically is about the cost of large language models, right? Google and other companies have been investing in large language model development for years, for years. So she knew about it clearly. And there is ginormous costs to building these AI tools. Monetarily, um, the article gives an example of the wild costs made that, to build these, the misinformation, um, as I just mentioned, suicidal ideation, unfortunate world things, mimicking human language, uh, college students um, have churned out bad advice that went viral. A Palestinian man wrote something that was mistranslated and was arrested because of the mistranslation. This virality, right? These are these are virality problems, and also the climate crisis. Using large language models, as you can see, transformers get cut off here. The carbon impact of using a huge amount of GPUs, huge amount of carbon. Um, in can be extremely problematic fueling the climate crisis. And the crux of um, Dr. Kapoor's article is that are all these negative things that can really, really harm individuals, minoritized folks, worth it for all this economic positivity for typically privileged white men or people who already have privilege in these systems? And is it really worth it? Can the language models be too big? And potentially you've also seen, um, this is just one example, but at the airport, I've been seeing these more and more with these face recognition that take your bio scan um, and really thinking about who it serves well, uh, surveillance tracking on a bigger scale. Potentially you've also seen, uh, you know, climate change affects everybody. New York City just had the worst air quality in the world a few weeks ago. It looked like this. And here in Seattle, just a few days ago, we had excessive, horrible, quote unquote, unquote, excessive bad air quality where it was dangerous to walk outside. And so a lot of people are thinking if, you know, excuse me for the language, um, what the hell are we doing? Can, are we dystopian looking into our VR, AR headsets of AI futures versus not seeing uh, the climate crisis and, and the problems around us? However, I do have some exciting and positive news about as we think about who is, who is profiting and otherwise. There was an article in the Times that talked about how OpenAI and other companies are leveraging workers around the world to make ChatGPT less toxic. They have been paying Kenyan workers, for example, less than $2 an hour to do screenings, to remove bad material, et cetera, the human in the loop. 
And ironically for this article, this image here was created in Dolly 2 in OpenAI's image tool. So literally, you know, Times is critiquing uh, OpenAI, but also using their tool. Since this article came out, uh, 150 African workers who work for OpenAI, ChatGPT, TikTok, and Facebook recently unionized in Nairobi because a lot of them are uh, working for these different companies and doing large scale content moderation or Mechanical Turk, however you want to talk about it, but the, their ability to already uh, unionize and, and come together as I don't think this is going away anytime soon, if anything, scaling this out more and more will be part of our future. So it's exciting to see the frontiers of what this may look like as we hopefully take better care of the people who are protecting people around the world. So a lot of the questions I get, maybe you have this question, maybe you don't, is the kind of why now? This has exploded in the last few months. Where did this come from? What's going on? Why now? And the real parts of the why now are in this trifecta. We have huge investments in processing power. Our computers are really strong. I'll, I'll break all these down. This is just the overview slide. Processing power with our GPUs, our computers muscle is extremely strong. Big data, we have huge amounts of data. Google size data sets, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. The size of these data sets is it's not to be underestimated. And then we also have machine learning where we are really seeing inferences amongst data points that's being chugged by these huge muscles of computers. So these learnings. And we can also have to mention the large investments uh, today and in the past of companies raising $220 million seed round um, for different startups um, with wild, wild valuations. The, the money being dumped in this also is, is just huge. So back to nuts and bolts. What is a large language model? For real, <laughs> LLM. A large language model is a computerized language model embodied by an artificial neural network, right, the machine learning, using an enormous amount of parameters. This is neurons, those dots in layers of tens of millions, of billions of weights between them. So parameters being factors, you can think about them as variables potentially. Um, they're pre-trained on many GPUs in a relatively short amount of time, a lot of processing whoosh, 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 uh, in, in milliseconds to massive parallel processing of vast amounts of unlabeled text with trillions of tokens, huge data sets that are provided by corpora, Wikipedia corpora, Common Crawl, Reddit, uh, different big, big data sets are being leveraged by these computers. So we have these ginormous data sets of language that are being crunched and we're seeing amazing patterns amongst them that are being leveraged for the user interface that you see. Another way to talk about um, computers advancing, I always like to show this slide of, this is the uh, computer that was in my middle school back in the day, this blue iMac on, on the left. In the middle, this is the screen that I'm currently presenting from, uh, my iMac. And then when we think about computers in a broad sense, these data centers that are being built in Salt Lake City amongst other places have huge, computing power and this processing power is required for us to be able to do this deep learning in, in a big way. GPUs, speed power and price and the cost of them going up and down. And I know we have some NVIDIA folks in the house. I have a few slides about NVIDIA. Uh, I was recently at a conference in San Diego where a Microsoft executive was talking about the advancements of his team. He has over 150 people who report to him today and we were asking about what are the limits of where his team can go. And he said, today, the only GPUs are the limitation. The computing power around the world is the limitation of our team. And they are building one data center every three days, every three days. I literally walked out of this talk and was like, do I need to buy more NVIDIA stock? Like gracious, this is wild stuff. Uh, this is not investing advice. You do your own research. Um, but there have been many um, viral 
videos, if you've not seen this one about if you know NVIDIA funding startups, startups buying NVIDIA products uh, amongst, you know, really thinking about a strategy where everyone's digging for gold in this AI gold rush. People are thinking about money. Why not sell the tools? Why not sell the shuffles in these scenarios to be the winner? And thinking about Microsoft, Google, Meta, it's really interesting. Every time I've been looking at this deck, Amazon isn't there. And I keep being like, Apple and Amazon, like, where are they? Where have they gone? Anyway, it's an interesting thing that when you see these, I did not make this graphic when other folks make them. Again, this is not investing advice, but I will say it's very interesting to have seen very recently the crypto crash, right? Crypto mining and Bitcoin um, explode and then implode. And then very shortly thereafter, we had you know generative AI spiking with our data centers, with huge gaming going on. Uh, it's extremely impressive, the investments they've made. So props to NVIDIA. Okay, we move on. When we think about big, big, big data sets, we are thinking about texts uh, and we're thinking about speed, but we're also thinking about um, video data. And I wanna talk about kind of different types of data that we can leverage for large language models, even if they are language. In my field, we talk a lot about this, but I don't think it's well talked about outside of TikTok outperformed YouTube in viewership in 2021 and 2022. Over 40% of Gen Z spends more than three hours a day on TikTok. If you are not hanging out with some Gen Z folks, you talk to them and see, but uh, it's the writings on the wall about how much time they are spending with video, with audio, uh, making viral. <laughs> There's some wild things going on in TikTok of people making a song and then people making variations of the song and then actually getting music deals from uh, this virality that's going on with TikTok. When we think about though the data sets that are going on, this is a video, audio, textual, contextual data set. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we think, if you're not a <laughs> data scientist nerd, uh, take, come, come with me on this little ex, uh, exploration here. So when we think about language data, and you may or may not use a, a Google Assistant or other type of assistant, where you say something like, book a flight from Los Angeles to Hawaii for less than $300. You got it, says the assistant, or you know, I'm looking for this. What the computer is doing is tagging in different parts of it for you know, geo city, which you see in this code, it says parameter, right? These are different variables. Geo state, Hawaii, amount, $300, but also currency, USD, right? Context, name, flight, book, uh, et cetera. And we're really looking and mapping on different entities depending on that use case, right? So you may need geography. Someone may not have said which currency, uh, didn't say which day, all those different factors that are important for this type of system. We also know that language is extremely predictable uh, to the point where if this is a voice recognition system, we are, if it's trying to distinguish amongst different choices, we are having something for dinner we're pretty sure it's fish and not father, but depending on the use case, we can really differentiate amongst these things by having predictability of engrams, looking to the left and right, guessing what that word might be. And when I talk about generative AI, a lot of people are like, I've never seen that before. I don't know, whoa, this is new, but you've been seeing this creep into your tech for years. You may or may not use predictive texting that guesses the next word in a string, generating a new output on LinkedIn perhaps, or other technology, you've seen it gives you examples of uh, ni nice prompts to answer Jen and Abhijit about. Um, this was from my um, Gmail. But really when we think about, you know, Google amongst other companies has been talking about this for years, how we leverage these different data points. Code generation, summarization, looking across these dialogues, pattern recognition, math words, that we're leveraging these pieces of data to build these robust and frighteningly fast models. These experiences are, this AI, are being translated into different experiences for different use cases. So this use case is specifically taking a photo of a person wearing a blouse. And here on the right, if you hopefully see the video, it's loaded. Uh, you can choose the body type 
and the skin tone of a person who may or may not look more like you than the model to see what that blouse looks like on different people in different price points. So search is becoming far more what we call multimodal, the modalities of how you're experiencing search. Now, some people might be thinking, hey, whoa, this is quite sophisticated. Only companies like Google and you know, this is an H&M and Google mashup, they can do these type of things. But in fact, this is more accessible to regular folks than, than you might think. Hugging Face, if you haven't checked it out, is an extremely powerful repo of models and data sets amongst other things. This is an open source company. They have over here, multimodal, you can look at feature extraction, you can look at text to voice, computer vision, natural language processing, token classification, and you can literally download these models right here, right now. Thousands of people have been downloading them and corresponding data sets, uh, documentation and pricing to match. So despite the fact that you may not be leveraging these today, a lot of people are really working on them in a, a very, sharing type of way, community-based way. Okay, I'll, I'll move a little faster. I know we got some time for questions. Large language models, one day you're in, the next day you're out, is the joke I've been making, just like Project Runway, that we have these back and forth different models that are the best in class as of the day, really looking um, at the launch of uh, GPT-3 that blew the world away. And now here we're into GPT-4. I've also heard of influencers saying, Something to the effect, this is a direct quote, anything before 2020 is trash, according to Raul at, at Datastax. Uh, so I'm really thinking about the pace of innovation and how do the models compare to other ones? And when we think about who has the big data, the metas and, and Googles and TikToks of the world, they are thinking strategically about what is their secret sauce? What is their differentiator? In fact, there was a leaked memo, if you've seen this one, Google wrote in their internal memo that was leaked, we have no moat and neither does OpenAI. Uh-oh. Google said in their memo, we have no secret sauce. People will not pay for a restricted model where free unrestricted alternatives are comparable in quality. And in fact, the child models are slowing us down. I don't know if this is development or actually runtime, but uh, having ginormous models can be problematic. As you can see, these models coming out weeks apart, um, it's, it's pretty impressive. And the size of them, GPT-3 versus GPT-4, is immense, immense. Uh, the big, big difference between GPT-3 and GPT-4 is about the multimodality. GPT-3 doesn't pick up on sarcasm and really stays with text, whereas GPT-4 leverages a huge amount of voice and um, visual data to execute. And Google has this lovely, uh, how those billion parameters really evolve and what, you know, as it gets bigger and bigger, is it actually providing value um, across those billions of parameters that the numbers <laughs> look somewhat similar, but they're actually really uh, effectual. Sundar, of course, has been talking about uh, AI and there's viral videos of splicing up him saying AI 140 times in his recent keynote, woof, uh, mentioning Bard, Palm, and Generative AI multiple times in his competi direct competition, OpenAI, only once. But some people are saying that perhaps better data, not big data, is the solution. What is the data that matches the context? What do we actually need? Well, I am grateful to say that I am actually an investor in one of these awesome tools that's called Viral Moment. Uh, and it is a computer vision and NLP company that scrapes uh, TikTok in addition to Reddit short form video to provide insights to huge companies. This video, for example, is if you've ever been on uh, TikTok and looked at the Puppuccinos, which is Starbucks, if you ask them, will give your dog a little frappuccino of just cream for your doggy, puppuccino. This video did not even say the word Starbucks, but it had the logo of the Starbucks in it that was able to be tagged by the solution that was built. Um, tagging, looking at virality a lot, lot earlier 
than other people might have found it and, and leveraging that strategically. Okay, I am realizing that I have a lot of slides and I wanna move through them to make sure that we get to your five. All right, I'm gonna skip the enterprise section and make sure that we hit the tools as that's I think the most important part and probably the reason why someone got up at 3 a.m. their time to be here. Uh, if you'd like to take a screenshot, this is the one I would recommend you take it out. These are the five tools for today. So OpenAI I've mentioned uh, has Jet, GPT and Dolly that start for free. There is a, an amazing QR code company I'd love to show you, Synthesia creates professional videos in minutes that only costs about 20 bucks a month. Aragon creates professional headshots. Okay, some of these are a little bit more paid than they used to be. I kept updating this. And Clip, uh, Clip Drop Co, Uncrop, uh, my mother-in-law was just using this recently. So OpenAI, as mentioned, most people have heard of it and few have tried. So again, let's go back to uh, OpenAI, today they have three flagship products, ChatGPT, which is the conversational interface, DALI, which creates realistic um, images and art forms, and their API, which you can integrate the, their tool into your application or business. ChatGPT looks like this. I, I've already spoken about this one. DALI, you can put in on a prompt and generate images up to a certain amount, and then you have to start paying. Create painting a brown haired woman on a futuristic water horse. I gave a talk recently about, about horses. Uh, so th these are what it first spits out and then you can tweak it and change it um, as well as there are different options where you can ask it to generate variations of a certain one, et cetera. And you might say, wow, this is really exploding what you can do with text and visual. And in fact, many countries have banned ChatGPT. Uh, Russia, China, North Korea, Cuba, Iran, Syria, and Italy. Um, although these sanctions are moving back and forth all the time. I actually was in Italy at the point where it was banned. It was, I, I took a screenshot of this because I was like, oh no, I really wanted to leverage it for something today for work. Uh, but it was banned at the time as people are trying to figure out what protections to put in place um, and a lot of systems and governments that are not ready. Uh, another example that I think is very exciting, QRBFT, you may have to join Discord to, to play with it. They have these, instead of these boring black boxes, these beautiful visualizations where they are putting QR codes and integrating them with imagery. I think these are utterly gorgeous. I'm a huge dog fan, so I find these really, really awesome. I was able to actually, before they put it behind the Discord, um, work. You can scan this right now and it'll take you to my personal website, hopefully, uh, if you use your smartphone. But these are more, more playful than, than some other QR codes could be. Also, I found out their, their direct competitor is this Fiverr person who you pay like five to 35 bucks and you can make these beautiful variations for your business or otherwise. Synthesia, create professional videos in a minute. Okay, this one ended up being Oh no, you can start for free, see, okay. Uh, you can create a professional video, for example, a demo or an explainer for a company or otherwise very, very quickly. It has text-to-speech for 120 languages and you can choose from 140 diverse avatars. It doesn't have to be just this person. There's no equipment, video editing skills required, et cetera. This is super no code, um, good user experience create a free AI video. Wow, this can save companies a whole lot of money, a whole lot of time. There's a lot of, of course, ethical implications of you're not hiring those people. Do you really have diverse actors and so forth? And this company just raised a wild amount of money as well. This company I have not tried, but I'm very excited to, uh, is Aragon. It transforms selfies into AI generated headshots. This is a huge problem I find with a lot of people who want to step it up in their professional lives, but do they have to get their hair done and get the makeup and potentially a nice photographer and a good background and anxiety mounts and they don't take the photos? Well, this one, and they just changed the prices, excuse me, it's true, uh, but their starter one is for $30 for a person. 
So you could drop a bunch of selfies and get out 40 high quality headshots with different styles in a few hours. That's incredible. And they do have to be from you. Uh, they have some privacy protections about, you know, not creating more photos of uh, other people or, or things like that. There's some pretty serious guardrails in place. I plan to use this in the next few months. I'm very, very delighted about it. It's called Aragon.ai. Another one that's, this one is free, uh, super, super applicable to a lot of the work I do is called uh, Clip Drop. My favorite product of theirs is called Uncrop. Have you ever taken a photo or something and then realized you actually need it to be in landscape or portrait or you want it to be bigger or smaller and otherwise? Yeah, this happens to me all the time, very annoying. And I took this photo of my dog sniffing this flower and then showed for you all when I said uncrop and made it a lot longer, you can see the flowers that were generated. And unfortunately, an eye got added to my dog's muzzle. Uh, this generator <laughs> didn't, didn't do so hot, but you can see the potential. These, these flowers look pretty good at the top here. If I only needed a little bit more buffer uh, of the top part for a new use case, this could be extremely helpful for me. Okay, and there's a sixth one and it is free. So we will eventually have a few that are awesome to try for you right now. This one's called Runway AI and it is all about making videos. It's more expansive though than the other example I gave, which is has more guardrails. Runway AI is a lot like Dolly. So I tried different variations uh, and you can scroll to see different options. Brown haired woman with backpack standing on the right side of mountaintop with views of snowy mountain vistas on a blue sky sunny day with a few whiskey clouds. Oh, typo, whiskey, yeah, whatever. Uh, hopefully this runs for you. Now I did see that she was standing and in the, in the video she's moving. Um, and additionally, I asked that she was on the right side of the mountain, but she's on the left side. So there, there's some things about, uh, this is what this video capability is in July, 2023. In a few months, in a year, what is the photorealistic qualities that we'll have of this video? I think will be astounding. This is also currently today for free to a certain amount. Um, and compared to the price of actually having to go to this location to hire this person, to put it all together, this is a really, really uh, inexpensive comparison point. Very exciting, runway.ai. So my hopeful future looks like we leverage ChatGPT and large language models to make our lives more efficient that can help with automated tasks, like digital twins of our, our selves that are automating um, tasks again and again. It helps us take time away from screens to connect with our community, friends, family, pets, and, and humans potentially uh, to enhance our creativity and connection move our body and get time outside to experience nature because of the time that we are not doing those repetitive tasks. Hopefully today you can walk away talking better about the advantages and disadvantages of new AI advances and understand more about kind of the why now of the explosion of what's going on. Please go try out these tools. I will again show this slide if you want to take a screenshot or otherwise. If you're also interested in not just a lecture format with a q and I am doing some workshops in the near future. I would love to see you at. I am doing a hands-on 90 minute workshop, 15 minutes of Joan Talks. The rest of the time we dive into the workshop material to get your hands dirty. There is a beginner, there are two sessions of beginner and there's one section of your project. Uh, and I have a Toastmasters code of Toastmasters 10 to get 10% off, it's, it's 25 bucks, but. Um, anyway, would love to see you all there if you're interested. Uh, this, these are the two beginner ones. And then the, the third one is a deep dive with ChatGPT to accelerate your projects. We'll be diving into whatever use case you wanna do. I've got a worksheet and everything. Lastly, I just mentioned I launched Clarity AI. People kept asking to hire me for this. And so I am letting them do so. Um, AI marketing made easy for different startups. If you know a startup that needs better marketing for their AI work, you can talk to me at hire AI, hireclarity.ai. It's been a long night. Okay, well, thank you so much. I have hit the 45 minute mark, I believe, and would love to take your questions. Let me put my video back on.
Thank you so much, Dr. Joan, for that incredible presentation. I think that kind of touched upon a few of the things that we were not really thinking in that direction. So thank you for planting all the thoughts in our mind. Um, everybody is encouraged to put uh, their questions in the chat. Um, I do see a few questions in the chat. One of the questions that came up was, uh, is there a think tank working on the best practices for legislation to control AI and um, address the ethical issues? And how is it being regulated? Yeah, I wish I had a more hopeful answer to that one. To my understanding, there were some CEOs that were brought into the White House and some conversations were had, but of the influencers I follow in the space, as mentioned, those um, amazing Black female researchers were not invited to the table, so I'm not extremely hopeful. Clearly, we need some regulation, right? Clearly, we need some um, guardrails from a legislative angle and Unless someone on this call could tell me otherwise, I, I don't know about something robustly moving forward right now in, to that end. Okay, hope that um, answers your question, Chris. Um, I also wanted to ask, maybe it's in the whole AI big picture level, a lot of the time more for creativity sake, um, skill building level, uh, kids are leveraging AI to help them out with different things. And, and some of the tools that you suggested is going to generate images, audio, and all these things. Some of them, um, at least from my mindset, we used to go to school and learn all these skills, hone all these skills, right? So taking the shortcut or the easier route, how is how do you think it's going to affect development in people right now and in the future generation? How do you think that's going to affect us? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, you talk about it as like a, a shortcut or a moving faster. A lot of the way, our, at least I went to public school for many years in the United States, and our education doesn't necessarily, you know, K through 12 or in college, prepare us for the real world of careers today. So there, I think there already is a mismatch going on. Not knowing how to leverage these tools is gonna be a huge disadvantage if you're not moving forward. As I mentioned with that uh, <laughs> meme of the cutting off of the different trees, uh, the tree limb. Um, but I think hopefully we go back, back to that creativity, expansive minds, what could we build? What needs to be built? What problems can we solve with these different tools? Because I think if it's just like, oh, my kid is doing a shortcut and not actually learning how to write a, an essay, I think there are different ways to, to conceptualize that. And I, I didn't mention a lot of prompt engineering, but the ability to ask these tools for what you want and to really customize that prompt engineering is, is no joke, a very helpful skill of how we manipulate these tools for the future. So I'm optimistic, but I, I can understand that there's a shift and a transition going on in, in that psychology. No, true, I agree. It's something new that we are not used to. And like you mentioned, there needs to be some buffer time to kind of adapt it and understand it. We do have some more questions in the uh, chat. One of the questions was, what do you find most helpful when formulating prompts? What are the things to keep in mind? Mm -hmm. One of my top tips I'm coming out with a worksheet about this very soon. One of my top tips is not to be too sparse. Mm -hmm. Say what you want to say. And even if your answer, like sometimes people are like, oh, just write an email, but you actually need an email of a certain length. You need bullet points. You, you want it to add emojis, whatever. It doesn't know that unless you ask typically. So being really, you know, I'd like this length and this many characters being, we not being okay regenerating, like it's not gonna be a human who's annoyed at you for asking again and again to do the task. It's just AI, right? So, so being um, creative and optimistic and excited. And once you have some prompts that work well for you, having those as a template that you can use again and again um, and iterate on, or you know what I mean? It doesn't have to start from scratch every time. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. The last time I did the same thing, on chat GPT said write an email and it just wrote something which was not what I was looking for till I put out all the specifics that I needed it to do so it totally makes sense um there are also questions 
Dr. Joan, about large language model and how their efficiency could uh, become better with time. Is oh, there a possibility sure. the size will go down? Yes, and I I, um, I talked about Professor um, Ying, um, better data, data that matches uh, different systems because the size of them, if it's not helpful data, is expensive on so many different levels, compute latency, et cetera. I really see a world, and I've worked on systems not so dissimilar where we say, this is you know people calling in from airports about this context. And so the data set is just people speaking at airports in this context. Like we don't need any other clutter from Twitter or Reddit, you know what I mean? Like really having quality data that matches the use case, strange as it may be, I, I really believe is gonna be the future um, and having different models that are consistently tweaked probably. I'm very excited to see the future of Hugging Face for sure. Exciting. I think this is a little more personal question. So feel free to answer as much as you like. Um, the, one of the questions is, what's your background and how did you get into AI? What what excites you about AI? Oh, sure. Uh, that's, that's not too personal. I've, I've had worse. Um, <laughs> uh, my background is as a linguist and a researcher. So I have a, a master's in linguistics, which is really where I saw NLP. And I was like, this is the future. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, I have a PhD in the field of speech language technology, which really looks across the stack specifically on audio data, uh, but also textual data and kind of how we build high quality performing systems. From there, I've worked in enterprise and startup and agency and the career keeps cacophoning, but that is my background. Thank you for sharing that. That's really helpful. On on that note, maybe I just, maybe not exactly matching on it. Now with all these tools available uh, to us, how how do we, maybe just let's take the job market. How do we differentiate between a candidate who is leveraging all these tools and giving us a better presentation versus a candidate who is probably doing everything from scratch and still kind of matching up the performance uh, of the other person who used AI tools? How do we draw a comparison between such candidates and how do we do that? Yeah, well, and I, I may have even a biased answer to your question because I was recently uh, interviewing some different developers for a project. And one of the biggest problems we had, or we, we need developers who leverage large language models. We were interested in hiring someone who already has been working in some prompt engineering. So if the developer only brings their skill set, and I know these different coding languages, blah, 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 wouldn't have been sufficient for the role I was just hiring for. They're never going to be as fast. The, the ability to write code, but then debug code that's built from AI is a skill set, or maybe that's a very specific example, but it was a skill set I was hiring for. And their ability, what, what was sometimes missing in some of the candidates were their ability to collaborate if they have problems, ask questions. So that kind of soft skill set was far more important, um, as well as leveraging ChatGPT and, and AI. But you're saying, is it a living level playing field? I think is one of your questions behind the questions. Right. Yeah. Right. And and people are trying to like, they can't cheat by doing this, and then people hack around and make a creative way uh, to you know hide hide their phones under there because you can have ChatGPT on your phone. I didn't mention that. Right. I'll add that to this deck. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I'm quite biased that learning how to use it properly and being excited about candidates who know how to use it properly, or like, what is the reason not to know this skill set? I'm not saying you have to, but the, the ability to use this new tool uh, sets people apart on the, on the job market the way I frame it. Yeah, maybe a very biased, very biased answer. Everyone in the yeah. chat, chat can disagree with me, but that's that's what it is. I mean, in, in one parallel uh, world, I think it makes completely uh, a lot of sense, right? Whatever is going on in the tech field, and if you're a person working in the tech field, knowing what's happening latest, leveraging that as your skill set definitely shows, even those soft skills of learning, keeping up with the time and saying, hey, you're open to new technology, new ideas. and 
you're adaptable. So I think that's a valuable skill set for anybody. But like you said, yeah, people might have different opinions and uh, we're happy to discuss them as well. Um, we did have a little more technical question. Uh, Deborah says that some companies have built or are building AI based on curated data sets. How do you think we'll be able to put uh, language learning models back in the bag or can we continue to use these data sets? Mm. Yeah, well, and I love this question because a lot of people have been wondering like, could we pause this? Can we put it back in the bag? And the answer for specific models is yes. Like OpenAI, I showed you that they have an API. They could stop the API, like the keys that were given out just stop overnight, like it is possible. The concept of all language models around the world no longer being used, I, I don't see that happening. And so I think really um, continuing the, with the future that we, we have. I do, some companies have built curated data sets. Yeah, I think high quality data sets, but I think especially if Google and OpenAI think they may or may not have good moats, <laughs> right? It's, it's really thinking about what is this nimble future um, with high quality data that we may or may not be seeing. So, we literally will be seeing it in the next 12 months. <laughs> Stay tuned to find out. Jokes aside, yes. On that, that note, I think you indicated something about the future also. Do you see a collaboration or something happening between Apple and Amazon in AI? You did hint at it a little bit. Did you oh, want to expand well, on it? Yeah, yeah. My hint was actually how surprised I am of how little we're hearing about them. If you know we have this fang, but now it needs to be changed because you know anyway, uh, which companies are part of that? Typically, in the tech highlights, we see a lot about Amazon and Apple, and I've certainly been seeing. I can go to the slide. I think I skipped over, but like Apple isn't using AI in their advertisements right now, like the jargon AI. And I wonder if, if their you know marketing team has thought like, is this just like NFTs? <laughs> is this just like metaverse? Like, do we really want to hop on the AI bandwagon? Amazon's doing some really cool projects with some mergers and acquisitions. But as far as when I think of some of the best products they have on AWS, it's a cloud built on NVIDIA. Again, I'm wondering where the moat is. Or do you, know, do you know what I mean? Like really thinking about where competitive differentiators are. I'm not trying to be about it with Apple and Amazon. I give Apple plenty of money with all the hardware <laughs> in my <laughs> office right here right now. And I live in Seattle, so there's an Amazonian every few blocks. Uh, but it is interesting at this uh, time and place to, to see so little of them uh, in the news. Well, yeah, we would probably just have to keep watching with bated <laughs> breath and see what surprise awaits us and says, hey, we did this, <laughs> which you didn't guess. I think we are almost at time. Um, for any other questions, I think we can always reach out to Dr. John. Oh, there's someone from NIST. Hello, people at NIST. Someone has given a better answer than mine about recommendations on frameworks and risk management. Yes. <laughs> AI Bill of Rights. Thank you, Deborah. Really appreciate it. I'm knowledgeable about some things to keep abreast of the whole field as it evolves is mostly impossible. I will copy this um, and read into it. Thank you very much for dropping that. Cool. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Dr. Joan, for this incredible presentation. Thank you for answering Thank all our so questions. Much. And Thank would love you. to see any of you who want to dive in. I know I'm not supposed to promote, but just in cases of interest, I'd love to see you at a, a hands-on workshop soon. Come come join me. That would be great. Okay. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for having me. It was a of pleasure. Course. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Cheers and there'll be a recording of the event available on the District 101 website if you want to rewatch it.